Good morning. Uh, I'm Michael Thurman, the CEO of DeKalb County, and I would like to welcome uh, the citizens and constituents who are viewing and listening to this broadcast to the uh, meeting of our DeKalb County COVID-19 Strategic Task Force. Uh, I also want to thank the uh, men and women who volunteered to serve uh, as members of the task force for your dedication, your commitment, and your resolve to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 to help us uh, refine and develop strategies and initiatives designed to respond uh, to this ongoing health and economic crisis. Uh, these are interesting times that we live in, uh, but I'm convinced that if we continue to, um, first of all, engage in an honest and transparent and forthright way, if we marshal and share resources and knowledge, skills, and expertise, uh, we'll continue to uh, meet and overcome the challenges that we face. Uh, we will emerge from this crisis a stronger, more unified county than the one that entered it. Uh, that's uh, my ongoing belief. Uh, I'm more convinced today than ever before. Uh, uh, as leaders, uh, you know, we wish and sometimes we pray uh, that we're in positions of authority and influence at critical points uh, in the history uh, of our county, city, state, and nation, and even in the histories and the realities that surrounding our family lives. So this is where we are. Uh, I believe that we've each been called for a purpose and with a purpose uh, to be here at this moment and at this time and to provide the leadership needed uh, at this critical moment. So I will stop now and ask uh, Ms. Dolores Crowell, our government affairs officer, uh, in my right hand, uh, if she will call the roll. Good morning, thank you, Mr. CEO. Uh, we'll start out as we always have uh, with the roll. Uh, under the health department, we have um, Dr. Sandra Ford, our DeKalb County Public Health Director. Morning. Um, Dr. Patrick O'Connell, Task Force for Global Health. Dr. David Ross, CEO, Task Force for Global Health. He'll be on shortly. He'll be, he'll be joining us shortly. Uh, Dr. Couples, associate with uh, Emory University. She's our, our registered nurse. I nurse practitioner. On, she's on. Her line is on mute. Yes. Yeah, okay, on. we see you. We Good morning. See. Good morning. We see you, Dr. Couples. Um, Board of Commissioners, our presiding officer, Steve Bradshaw. I'm here. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Lorraine Cochran Johnson. Present. Uh, former CEO, uh, the Honorable Leanne Levitan. I saw you, I think. Okay. Uh, former interim CEO, Honorable Lee May. Present. Um, Board of Education, Superintendent Ramona Tyson. Uh, Judicial, uh, Chief Judge Asha Jackson, Superior Court. Public Safety, Chief Joseph Cox. Public Safety Director, uh, Chief Jack Lumpkin. He's Present. on. Uh, Sheriff Melody Maddox. She'll be on later. She will join us later. Uh, House Chairwoman, uh, Carla Drenner. They're in session. They're in session. And that would also apply to uh, Senate Chairman Emmanuel Jones, also in session. From the cities, we have uh, Mayor John Ernst from Brookhaven. I'm here. Okay. Um, I just got a call from Mayor Melody Hammett. I think she may be trying to dial in. Um, on the business side, we have uh, Ms. Ann Hanlon, President of Perimeter CID. I saw you, Ann. Here. President of Metro uh, South CID, uh, Emory Morrisberger. Incredible. That's the handsome gentleman to my left. That must yes. be him right yes. there. Yes, the incredible Emery Morseberger. <laughs> yes. 
uh, president of Brookhaven Chamber, Alan Goodman. Um, King Coleman, president of the Cab Chamber. Coleman, president, and still trying to be like Emory Morseberger when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Cab uh, Development Authority interim director, Dorian DeBar. Present. Uh, on human services, we have Lamar Smith from DFAX. Uh, also spoke with Samia Abdullah. She has a conflict today. She's helping a family in need. Uh, Mr. Jim Radovian. I'm here. Um, in media, we have Ms. Jeannie Lynn. I'm present. Thank you. And transportation, um, CEO Jeff Parker from Marta. All right. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you all once and taking time out of your busy, hectic, and uh, schedules to uh, participate in our ongoing efforts uh, in DeKalb County. We missed one person. Yes, I apologize. We missed uh, the Honorable Jeff Rader, Commissioner, District 2. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so as we move forward, uh, we first, we would like to give you some baseline understanding of uh, the initiatives and strategies that are being implemented that are now uh, ongoing in DeKalb County. And because this is primarily first a health crisis, we would like to begin with uh, Dr. Uh, Sandra Ford, uh, who will provide us with an update on the uh, efforts that are ongoing with our Board of Health. Dr. Ford. Dr. Ford, you need to unmute, please. You would think I would know this stuff by now. Good morning, everyone. Um, so over the last uh, two weeks, we have seen more than 7,000 new cases um, in the state of Georgia. Um, DeKalb is fortunate that our, our increase has been dramatically less, even from a percentage perspective. We've had about 250 new cases, which is certainly not to be ignored. But we have had... Um, a significant jump in the number of deaths. I believe we're at um, 155 right now, and that's up. The issue with the deaths, though, is that um, it's hard to track the numbers every single day because um, a lot of those are post-mortem findings, and so it may look like a, a dramatic jump over a single day, but it may be that these are older cases that are simply now being counted as COVID deaths. Nevertheless, um, still a big concern. And our primary focus in terms of interventions remains our long-term care facilities because um, of the vulnerable nature of those residents. So what we've been doing is um, going with the support of DeKalb County government who has provided us vehicles. We take teams to the long-term care facilities and provide testing not only for the residents, but for the staff as well. And so that has been very effective in um, trying to manage this disease and we're planning actually to use that model in the fall for flu clinics as well so that we can do that same type of effort to protect them from uh, other infectious diseases. Um, so most of you receive, I hope, um, our data that we provide bi-weekly or twice a week actually um, on the current COVID numbers for the county and it's mapped out by zip code. And also we provide you a, a visual representation. And what is striking to me is that uh, for the bulk of this process, as we have been managing this pandemic, most of the cases, um, the high numbers were in the, the South District. Um, zip codes 3058, um, 3038. Um, those numbers seem to be calming down a bit. And now what we're seeing, um, our latest increase right now, our highest percentage is in 30329, which is that um, Brookhaven-ish area. And so that's, that's sort of what I expected because um, we have made a more targeted um, effort to reach the Hispanic Latino community. 
And so what we are finding, interestingly enough, is there's so much suspicion about testing and a lot of misinformation because we were getting reports that people were saying, you must have a driver's license to be tested. That is untrue. And so I've been working very closely with um, leaders in the Hispanic Latino community to help them understand. The only reason we would be asking for any type of demographic information is merely to contact you and provide you with your results. That's it. Um, and so we've been really targeting those communities. Um, we're still managing the zip code level data. So wherever we see spikes, that's where we're targeting our efforts. Right now we have um, six mobile units um, throughout the county. And Monday we will have an additional unit added um, at Green Forest Church. The faith-based community has been extremely supportive of our efforts and have provided us with space to set up um, testing sites at their locations. And that's been really helpful because that's such a, a community-based effort. Um, we are moving forward with that. And, um, you know, also being mindful of the, the civil unrest and, and the implications in terms of increasing testing numbers. Um, we have always been aware that both violence, trauma, and racism are public health issues. And so we're trying to make sure that, you know, we're mindful of um, ensuring that those folks who are protesting um, have tests available for them because a lot of them are not wearing masks. And so we're concerned about what that means in terms of our infection rates moving forward. Um, we're also planning a first responder day um, in the county where we make a, a, a targeted um, effort to invite first responders to be tested. And we'll be providing more information on that as we move forward. Um, other um, interventions that we're planning long term, um, one of the things I have noticed as the health director is that I'm, as we start to discuss reentry more aggressively, I am receiving a lot of calls from individual entities throughout the county um, asking for guidance on um, uh, all kinds of different things from, you know, wait, waiting rooms, water supplies, all these types of things. And um, to be honest, it's a lot for a single individual to manage all of these different types of um, specialized um, advice. And so one of the recommendations we'll have um, for the CEO is um, a team that would help us with this effort. Um, I would need an epidemiologist to collect the data and understand you know, what our current levels of risk are, a um, environmentalist, because a lot of this has to do with water and um, safety, uh, apologies. And then finally, um, a, a, I'm thinking a design person, because a lot of what we're asking is um, about spacing and simple things that maybe make, make a big difference. How do you space your waiting room? How do you manage the work area? What kinds of protections? Do you need a plexiglass shield or with something less be helpful? Um, and so there's a lot, so much to think about with, when we talk about re-entry. And so I think having a team that could provide individual advice would be very helpful. And I'm even um, thinking about maybe hiring an extra set of environmentalists who could then assist with actually assessing facilities and saying whether this is, you know, what here's some things you can do that will assist you in feeling better about reopening and, and how you can communicate that to your clientele. Um, we're very excited about that. We're also um, trying to pull together a metro group to um, have a, a uh, regional plan. Um, it is like herding cats trying to manage all of our very, very um, intense schedules right now. But um, that would be very helpful if we could pull it off. Um, so those are just some of the things I'm working on right now. Um, as always, we are very grateful to the county for their support. Um, we're working on um, getting the specs for our mobile units that we will then really be able to um, dig into the community and make sure that access is no longer an issue for anybody in this county. Um, and also in the same vein, providing um, nutrition support from our mobile farmers markets that will be part of this mobile unit. So um, right now it's in the planning process of getting our orders in and all the details about what this should look like and what, what it should be, what should be inside and those types of things. Um, we are still struggling with manpower. Um, we have the same issues that everyone has in terms of people um, still having challenges coming to work. And um, we need to start opening our centers. This summertime, we're going to have to start planning for immunizations as we discuss um, school reopenings. And so 
we're trying to manage that as well. And we may actually be using some of those mobile units to support that effort as well. Um, I was thinking about even showing up at specific schools like we do um, for our emergency preparedness efforts. We have points of distribution in, in local high schools where that would be if there were a an emergency and we needed to utilize the strategic national stockpile, that's where we would provide medications. But we could do that same type of thing post up at the high school and that's where the children would do drive through immunization. So we're just trying to be creative as we talk about reentry and think about ways that we can get the, the community back in gear, but also ma maintain the level of safety that we need to have um, to operate. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Ford. Could you list the, uh, the testing sites that we now have uh, standing? I knew you were gonna ask me that. Um, so we have, um, Kingswood Church in Dunwoody. We have, um, uh, and just because you asked me, it just flew up my head. We have- um, I can um, help, Salem. Salem. Um, Bible Church. Yes. Good grief, what is that, Pastor? You have uh, Greater Piney Grove. Greater Piney Grove, hold on. Green Forest will start Monday. We have Doraville. And Rehoboth, that's the one I'm missing, Rehoboth. So let's walk back through it one more time. No, I'm gonna give you the whole one. list. I know, okay. I'm looking. I keep this in my head. Oh, I know how I can find it. Um, the other thing I just wanted to share, um, yesterday we actually had one a record testing number. We had over 600 tests done in a single day. Um, so we are really being aggressive about uh, making sure that folks are getting tested. Let me... There we go. So we've got Kingswood, Kingswood Church. We have Rehoboth Baptist Church. Kingswood, by the way, is now Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturdays that they're open. Rehoboth Baptist Church, Eula Baptist Church, Greater Piney Grove, Salem Bible Church, and then the Doraville site. So, um, and we will also open again Green Forest on Monday. So that's three, six, seven sites that we'll have, in addition to our um, strike teams that are addressing the long-term care facilities. Thank you, Dr. Ford. Thank you. Are there questions for Dr. Ford? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Mayor Ertz. Hi there, Dr. Ford, good to see you again. Um, what is, uh, the, on the testing, what's the current turnaround time uh, from test to uh, results? Um, and what, if we're up to 600, what do you believe our current capacity is per day? Um, great question. I think he's asking about the testing because as y'all as y'all know, that has been a challenge for us. But we finally seem to have a, a lab that um, is managing this very well. I think they've all ramped up um, the testing and now they're working essentially for our so our turnaround is anywhere between Dr. Ford. Four and eight hours. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Your your mic is breaking up a bit. Uh, no, that's better. Um, so you want me to just take it off and speak directly into the computer? That usually doesn't work, but I can try it. No, that's better. Whatever I just did? Yeah, whatever you did is better. Okay, sorry, I just kind of shifted it a bit. Did you hear what I was saying or do I need to? Not really, no. Okay, so um, in terms of testing, uh, the last and Now it got worse again. Not working again? Yeah. What is it? Uh, how about now? Yes. Okay, I won't, won't touch it. Okay. Um, so the turnaround time right now, to, to summarize, is about 24 to 48 hours. We have a good reliable lab now um, and a good a good process for um, you know, getting folks through. Um, in terms of capacity, so our, our most, um, our busiest spot right now is Rehoboth. Rehoboth did 218 tests yesterday. So if you multiply that by eight, you know, we could probably pull in close to 2,000 tests a day if we need It's really, our issue is a matter of the number of tests that we have available. And since that's no longer a problem for us, you know, capacity is just based on the speed within which we, you know, get folks in and out. And our lab that you have can handle all those tests. If you had 1,800 tests in a day, you'd still have the same turnaround time, roughly? I would believe so because they have dramatically ramped up their manpower on their there are multiple counties utilizing this lab, but we're still having a really good turnaround. I'm breaking up again. Okay, we'll try. Uh, Can I ask you a question? 
Okay. Yeah, we, we'll come. I'll come to you. You next, Jim. Uh, okay. Reverend May. Thank you, Mr. CEO. Uh, this is for Dr. Ford again. Uh, number one, thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Ford, for your team. We did a testing site. Uh, we serve. Uh, about 300 people who were living in uh, those extended stay hotel situations like that's their home. And we set up a mobile site there. So your team was awesome. The turnaround times were great as well. That was on a Saturday afternoon. And I started getting calls back Monday morning telling me that their results were in. So that was that was really awesome. Thank you again for that. Uh, two things regarding testing. And you kind of, you mentioned uh, both of these, but... Um, with these protests that are kind of going on around the, um, the the city, the metropolitan area, do you have the capacity to, and, and most of these are not planned. I, I attended the Georgia NAACP uh, march on uh, this uh, earlier this week, Monday. And so that was planned. It was structured. It's easier for you to kind of team up with them. But do you kind of have the mobile capacity if something were to pop up to be able to send a team out and do testing kind of, you know, um, in, in, in a short notice at all? No, we wouldn't because right now everyone is assigned and ahead of time, like we plan these sites, you know, and so even in terms of um, reaching out to the protesters, it would be to offer testing at our current sites. It would be a challenge to set that up just manpower wise. Um, resources we have, but it's just a body thing trying to, you know, everybody can't do those tests, the specimens. Awesome. All right, we'll take uh, two more questions. I know we had Jim and one other question after Mr. Uh, uh, Bredoni. Uh, okay. It's pretty short. Do we have a list of all the um, sites and what times they're open? Or can we yeah. get one? They should be on our website, but we also send out a press release. I'll make sure that um, uh, you're included on our list. But yes, it's, it's, it's posted on the web. Uh, Dr. Ford, if you could direct it to Ms. Kroll, and we'll yeah. share it with all the members of the task force. Perfect. Thank you. All right. And one more question. If there another, uh, Ms. Levitan, Ms. CEO Levitan. Or CEO Michael Thurman. Thank you. I'd like to commend um, the health department for the great job that they're doing. I mean, this is a difficult thing. An observation, Dr. Ford, that I had, you mentioned at 30329, you had the largest amount of deaths. Um, ARC did. Jesus. Just cases, not oh, cases. Okay. Well, ARC um, did a study, and this is part of District Two, but this um, area had the largest number of seniors. I think about forty-five percent, because we had worked on some transportation issues. I was also wondering if something could be done to pinpoint that area because people are not—they um, they want to stay in their homes. These seniors and. Also, another thing, um, with the flu season coming up, um, strategically planning, um, is there something that um, the health department could do urging people to get their flu shots or maybe even seeing if we could provide those things? Um, because, um, you know, we're talking still a couple of months off before it's recommended. But I think you're doing a great job and the distribution of these um, sites are really um, very, very good. And um, I know that the mayor of, um, shall I say, Brookhaven, I, I still can't get used to saying Brookhaven, but that's okay, John. But um, you all are doing a great job too. And um, I just was wondering, you know, looking forward um, to sort of advertising flu season. So just for clarity, did you say 30329 was the high zip code with the C a high senior population? Well, it was District 2. We we, we did it by District 2. Which oh, okay. I'll still look up the district. Um, I, I'm not sure if John Woody goes all the way up to 3032. Does it, um, Mayor? Uh, I don't No, John Woody's a little north of there. Yeah, so in other words, it's the Choco Hills area and going, you know, almost. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, it's I mean, right across the, like that, um, across okay. Keys, Choco. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sure that arrangements could be made to get a site there if, you know. Yes, yeah. we're working, working on it. We, can give me, we, we need to talk because you've done a great, great job. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so to answer the, your camp, the flu campaign, our flu campaign starts in September because that's when we see, receive the actual flu vaccines. 
Um, and I'm hoping that, I mean, every year it's a challenge to get folks to take the shot, I, I won't lie. Yes. Um, and so we, we, we always have an aggressive campaign about around flu. Um, at this point, it will be a challenge to offer it free because we have to pay for it, but it's we accept all types of insurance, and so um, that generally has not been a challenge. Um, I wanted to say something also about contact tracing. Um, we have Good. started to ramp that up. One of our challenges, though, is that people are very hesitant to provide us with the contacts, and all of a sudden now, can't remember who I was around. Uh, I only know a first name. I don't have an address. And so um, that's going to hinder us trying to manage this disease. And so um, this afternoon, actually, I will be doing a, a PSA um, about contact tracing um, in partnership with PCTV to, to let people know this is okay. We're not trying to get anything but who you've been around. And this is the reason why. Um, we're also going to try to do that um, in Spanish if I can wing it. Um, so that we make sure that community is clear on what our intent is as well. All right. Thank you, Dr. Ford. Thank you. Excellent report, and thank you so much for your leadership. We're very proud of you, and of course, we stand ready to support in any way possible that you need us. I'd like to welcome uh, also Mayor Hammett, the uh, head of the DeKalb Municipal Association, as well as Commissioner Larry Johnson, who's uh, joined the meeting. Thank you and welcome uh, to both of you all. May I add one more thing, sir? Yes, ma'am. You know, I want to talk about um, budget-wise from a state perspective. Um, the, the preliminary budget just went out, and uh, they did decide to cut public health at the state level dramatically. I, think, I believe it's $14 million. Um, that will impact some of our services. Um, state employees will be furloughed um, 12 days this year. I am a state employee, so um, we're, we're a little concerned about that. And so we're also asking for some support in um, however that works and trying to make sure that our, our budget is protected. Um, we have been very fortunate to have been supported at, at the county level, but um, a lot of the issues we have are around personnel. And if they are cutting programs and um, other support, it's going to be a challenge to manage not only our COVID, but our day-to-day -day operation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one of the areas that, uh, as we laid out an outline on our COVID um, federal response uh, program in terms of allocating and appropriating uh, CARES Act dollars. Uh, one area that uh, we knew that we had a deficit of, uh, at least I did, of information was in mental health. Uh, studies that I've read as well as media coverage has uh, uh, really opened my eyes to the fact that we think of COVID obviously as a health problem, physical, but there's been a significant amount of emotional and psychological and mental trauma associated with this disease. And on top of that, uh, trauma associated with um, the killing of George Floyd and more recently uh, here in Atlanta, Mr. Brooks, and you see a community, a state that's in, 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 in being affected in the most serious way by uh, news coverage and by the realities of life. So what I was able to do, and I'm very proud, I reached out to uh, Commissioner Kathy Gannon, uh, who served for many years on our community service board uh, to lead the effort to reach out uh, to our community service board to help us fashion a strategy uh, that the board of commissioners and the CEO and the governing authority could invest in that will enhance our ability to provide services to our citizens. So I would like to call on uh, Commissioner Gannon and uh, she will introduce the uh, acting uh, director of our uh, community service board here in DeKalb County. Commissioner Gannon. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Our acting director, Fabio Vandermeer is here and he's going to present to us. Um, I hope you can hear. I'm not gonna say too much. Um, my social work days were um, pre, commission days, so that's a little bit of a time ago, but I have um, really appreciated all that I have learned in um, serving on the community service board. You know, some of us came up in the old days when we had mental health centers on every corner, or not every corner, but we didn't have a great deal of contact with people who needed it. And now we have a community service board that's a partner with the state, and they are out there in the field with residential and outpatient and the need during COVID 
as the CEO pointed out, is, is great and is growing, but it's also, you know, you can't go to a center and ask to talk to someone. So we were looking for a way to do that kind of outreach in this crisis um, capacity. So I want to introduce to you, um, as many of you know, we have recently lost uh, Dr. Bona, who is a longtime advocate and head of the Community Service Board. And um, Fabio has been doing a great job as the acting director, COO, and several other titles at the same time. So I'm going to let him talk to you about the various kinds of outreach type services that they have in mind. The Board of Commissioners um, have also been reviewing this and has been very supportive. And there is a um, bill in uh, on our agenda for Tuesday to actually start appropriating money from the CARES Act to get this effort going. So if you would take the floor, Mr. Vandermeer. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Gannon. I appreciate the introduction and thank you, Mr. CEO, for also the invite to the task force. Um, so uh, my name is Fabio Vandermeerva. Um, uh, as Commissioner Gannon mentioned, I'm the acting executive director. Um, you know, through all the the issues that are going to be going on, uh, Dr. Bona passed away rather recently. So we're we're working on main, maintaining the good work that he started with the agency. Um, so just for the, for those who may not know, the CAB Community Service Board, uh, we're a public nonprofit provider of community-based mental health and substance abuse and developmental disability services. We're one of 24 uh, CSBs in the state. Uh, we have served the citizens of DeKalb County since 1994 as a community service board. And we started way back before that as being a, a division of the uh, Board of Health. Uh, and then we split off in 1994. We have 20 locations across DeKalb County. And last year we had 15,000 uh, admissions to our various programs. Um, so we are considered the safety net um, for DeKalb County when it comes to mental health substance abuse and uh, developmental disability services, we primarily serve individuals with no insurance or limited insurance. So I think um, when um, uh, Mr. CEO and Commissioner Gannon approached us with, uh, you know, looking at mental uh, wellness and uh, kind of the mental health crisis that is coming behind um, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we look to see, you know, how can the CAB CSB um, support the county, support the citizens, um, and what we were seeing as well in terms of increased need for mental health services. So I think we put together a plan that really prioritizes access to these services. And that was our kind of main focus. Is how can we ensure that, that individuals in the community have access to mental health services? And we looked at primarily focusing on community engagement and telehealth expansion. Um, so we have a network of our own clinicians and psychiatrists, uh, case managing staff, and we looked at ways of how can we provide access to that network. Mm -hmm. So first one would be our telehealth expansion, uh, investing into the infrastructure and resources where we can dedicate staff, clinical staff, psychiatrists, LCSWs, LPCs, um, where we can create um, telehealth stations with different community partners. So we could put a um, kind of a, a computer with an access point where people can go to and talk to a psychiatrist or talk to a clinician through that location. Um, and, and, and then through there, be able to also access those resources uh, through their own phones or their own devices. So being able to kind of expand that network and connections. Uh, the other uh, part is we currently have a mobile crisis uh, team. Uh, we have one uh, trained psychiatric nurse who currently works with the Cab County Police uh, and they support the, the, the county the police department. They'll go on to calls where there may be a mental health crisis and this is a great um, collaboration and we've had this for years, but we right now only have one position that that works with the county police. So we're looking at expanding that, especially uh, given this time with COVID-19 and looking at ways of how you know police departments could have uh, better resources to serve individuals with a mental health crisis. 
Uh, I thought this, this was a really good program for us to, to focus on expanding. So we're looking at adding uh, two psychiatric nurses um, and, and adding additional shifts uh, to that program with the county police. The other component is uh, kind of, we talked a lot, uh, Dr. Ford talked a lot about, you know, mobile clinics. Um, we're also working on creating a mobile uh, mental health clinic as well, um, where we have a case manager who's um, with a vehicle that can go out to different community events, work in partnership, uh, not only with the Board of Health, but other community providers, uh, where we have case managers who can talk to individuals, provide information, but then also have on board the van that telehealth portal to then connect to trained psychiatrists and licensed clinical staff. Um, so once again, trying to make sure we can get out into the community and get that access because individuals can't come to the clinic. I mean, that, that right now it's either they're resistant to coming to the clinic um, or they're not able to get there. Uh, another part is our central access line. We do have a crisis line. So uh, we're, we're seeing an increase in calls to that line. Um, so having additional support for that crisis access line. And then lastly, um, a therapeutic virtual summer camp. Uh, we work closely with um, uh, the CAB um, uh, County Schools. Uh, we're already in uh, several schools in the county working with uh, children in those schools. Uh, so during the summertime, providing a uh, therapeutic virtual uh, summer camp, as well as sharing that summer camp with the, uh, uh, the county uh, summer camp program as well. So being able to uh, both work with the partners we have, as well as being able to offer that program to um, other county programs for children. Um, so that's kind of our initial um, kind of first phase focus of the CARES funding is really trying to maximize access to these services um, and access to our network um, so clients can, can get, uh, so uh, citizens can get the services that they need uh, very easily, very quickly. So I guess, is there any uh, questions for me? All right, thank you, Dr. Vandermeery. Uh, uh, Commissioner Gannon, is there a uh, appropriation of budget number associated with the proposal that will be considered by the commissioners next week? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. It's uh, two point, and help me on this, Fabio, two million and um, several hundred thousand. All right. Thank you. Are there questions? Thank you so much. I want to personally thank uh, Commissioner Gannon for leading this effort. It was an uh, area of great need for myself as a leader. I want to thank Dr. Vandermeer for responding positively. He and his staff, we had uh, at least three meetings that I was involved in. I was very impressed not only with him, but also the level of uh, uh, dedication and experience and, and just pure commitment. Uh, demonstrated by the staff who we engage with. And thank you so much, and we look forward to working with. You. Also like to acknowledge the presence of the distinguished Mayor of Dunwoody, who's joined us, Mayor Leon Dorsch. Mayor, good morning. Yeah. Um, what we are doing. And she's on a different call. So we'll move forward now, a key area and uh, Dr. Ford alluded to it, uh, really the private sector, and that is how we will be able to support and continue to reopen uh, business and particularly small business in DeKalb County. Uh, I want to thank our presiding office commissioner, Steve Bradshaw, for volunteering to lead uh, our small business subcommittee on the task force in Number one, engaging business owners, uh, helping to understand the challenges that they are facing and will face uh, throughout the remainder of this crisis. And uh, I think, I know uh, presiding officer is in a position to update us on the steps and the information and this path uh, forward for us as we continue to address uh, the other side of this crisis, which is the economic one uh, to support business and support those who work at those businesses uh, as we uh, restore our the health as well as the economic vitality of our community. 
uh, presiding officer Bradshaw. Thank you, Mr. CEO. Good morning to you and good morning to the members of the task force. I do have a uh, presentation, so I'll ask Mr. Matelski to go ahead and cue that up now and prompt us through it. And I will try to be brief, operating within the time constraints that Ms. Uh, Dolores Kroll has <laughs> given me. Uh, <laughs> next slide, please. So we started with a mandate to focus on how we can be of the most assistance to the business owners and the employers in DeKalb County, and then come back with recommendations. Mr. CEO, your original appointees for this task were myself, uh, Mr. Kenny Coleman from the chamber, and Mr. Emery Morseberger from uh, the CIDs. We received this mandate from you on April 29th, and we've been decisively engaged since then. See, my next slide's already been prompted. So uh, that is the entire uh, subcommittee. And you can read all of the names. It is the, a distinguished group of individuals. And let me just say this, this, this group has been outstanding, uh, dedicated with their shoulders to the wheel, serious about getting this task done. Uh, some of the members are a part of this task force, but every single person brought value to this exercise. And uh, certainly uh, before this presentation ends, I want to afford any of them who are here on the call with us to speak and offer their insights on the experience we went through. I will highlight one name. The last name on that list is my chief of staff, Ms. Alicia Brooks. She wasn't a formal member of our committee but she served as our meeting coordinator and note taker and corraler and kept us all on the straight and narrow as she does for me on a day-to-day -day basis. So I certainly wanted to highlight her contribution to this process. Next slide, please. So our primary methodology for gathering information was a series of uh, Zoom meetings that we conducted with various industry sectors to get their insights on what they're experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. And these sessions ranged anywhere from 60 to 90 minutes. And in those sessions, we posed three basic questions. Number one, how has this pandemic affected you operationally? Number two, how has this pandemic affected your business financially? And number three, what recommendations would you uh, make to DeKalb County that would be of the most help to you? And then we listened. And I'm gonna underscore that point. We listened. We didn't start with preconceived concepts or notions. We listened to our business leaders, have them tell us their stories. And I can tell you that uh, those sessions were insightful I can tell you that sometimes listening to those stories were heartbreaking, uh, but I think everyone who was engaged would appreciated being asked to participate and share their insights with us. Next slide, please. So this is a list of the sectors that we met, met with. You can see that represents a cross section of businesses and industries, large and small in DeKalb County. Also, I think we captured most of those meetings via Zoom. So if anybody's curious about circling back and seeing what we heard and who exactly we talked through, all that meeting, all that information is there out in the open for anybody to review. Next slide, please. So I wanna pause here and really give a big salute to our businesses here in DeKalb County who demonstrated adaptability and resilience during this crisis. They should be commended for the way they have handled this situation. And some of these business leaders have had to make some tough decisions, some tough decisions about operating hours, some tough decisions about laying people off. And to be certain, it has taken a toll. But again, our businesses have adapted and they've demonstrated resilience and that should certainly be commended. Next slide, please. And in addition to the sector meetings that we have, our, our recommendations are informed by some other data points. Uh, Decide to cab, did a small business survey, very insightful. Uh, I know that was published sometime within the last two weeks. 
Also, you know, DeKalb County is not an island. There are other jurisdictions around us putting forth proposals. Certainly we are informed by that, but I want to underscore the point that our recommendations are DeKalb centric. We are not Cobb, we are not Gwinnett, we are not the city of Atlanta, and the businesses that we talk to are here in DeKalb County. Next slide, please. So what follows is uh, six basic straightforward recommendations and I underscore the word actionable recommendations, meaning they're not pie in the sky, they're not aspirational. They're things we think that are actionable that we can act upon in the short term. Uh, and they're very straightforward. Next slide, please. So our first recommendation is around public safety. We did not attempt to, attempt to reinvent the wheel on proscribing how businesses reopen. The CDC, which is right here in DeKalb County, has put forth a set of guidelines. We recommend conforming to those guidelines. The big takeaway from this slide is personal protective equipment, PPE. PPE is a business expense. If companies, businesses are providing PPE to their employees, that's an expense that they didn't have before COVID-19. If businesses are handing out you know, mask and PPE to customers when they come to the store or business, that's a business expense that they didn't have for COVID-19. So we recommend pursuant to the lines of the Cab County setting up a stockpile for our employees, we recommend setting up and funding a stockpile of PPE for the businesses in the Cab County that they can access. And we recommend setting up some sort of requisition process where they can go in requisition what they need at no expense to them. And then at that point, we have real-time data on exactly where the needs are and in what volume. So that's recommendation number one. Next slide, please. Recommendation number two is establishment of a small business loan fund. We can determine if it's a loan fund or a grant fund. We'll leave that to the administration. But this is the big ticket item. And what we call for is a $30 million allocation. The focus should be on small businesses that did not receive PPP funding from the federal government. And we do not prescribe specific loan amounts. Each business will be different. Their needs will be different. What they require will be different. So we make no attempt to prescribe uh, in that much granularity. I will say that uh, setting this number was an internal debate amongst our committee members. You know, we started with some range fans, some parameters. The administration, the administration, original proposal was 10 million. I think Cobb put out a proposal for 50 million. You know, those set the boundaries of the, our parameters as far as we were concerned. We settled on a figure of 30 million. We figured that's that's a uh, enough in the short run to uh, give the businesses what they need and we anticipate there will be significant need to access these funds. One more point I make is the functional definition of small business derived from uh, information that our chamber uses, but basically it's $1 million or less in revenue and 20 or fewer employees. Now, again, we don't prescribe this as a strict limitation but as a functioning operating parameters, these are the types of businesses we suggest focusing on. Next slide, please. Recommendation number three is a robust communication, education, and marketing campaign. What we heard from our businesses is we need to be out promoting DeKalb County businesses. This $500,000 figure that we recommend for such a campaign is derived uh, from a memo that was put forward by our CVP, B, Commission and Business Bureau for a marketing campaign. So we certainly uh, took note of that. But our businesses, as we talked to them, underscored that is in, it is imperative that we get the word out. That number one, the Cab County is open for business and our businesses are open. And number two, that we urge, encourage our citizens to support local DeKalb County businesses. So a marketing campaign directed to those objectives is something they said that they would be very appreciative of. Next slide, please. 
Recommendation number four is to support business flexibility and innovation. So we should be looking for opportunities to afford business as much flexibility as possible. And in the meetings that we had, two things came through loud and clear. Number one, we need to recognize that every business is different. Their needs are different. How they're coping is different. We, our, our thought process and policies need to recognize that difference. And number two, we should allow businesses to experiment and be innovative. And DeKalb County should not be a hindrance to experimentation and innovation as these businesses try to find their way. And a couple of examples, expanding outdoor seating or expanding the use of third party inspectors to speed up the permitting process. Anything we can do that ind indicates by our actions that we are supporting our businesses instead of standing in their way is something that our business leaders uh, said to us loud and clear. Next slide, please. Fifth recommendation is potential deferment of business licensing fees or late fees for business licensing. And notice this is not waiving those fees, it's just deferring them uh, as our businesses have an opportunity to get back on their feet. I engage with planning. I think the total cost to the county is maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars, which isn't a whole lot of money, but indicating this willingness to be flexible to our businesses is something that they said that they were very much appreciate. The next slide. And uh, the final slide is, uh, our final recommendation is uh, unity of command. And, you know, I beg your indulgence, but this is a concept that I learned as a young army officer. It's also a principle of war and make no mistake about it, we are at war with this virus, this pandemic. And it basically holds that there should be one place where the buck stops. And what we heard from our businesses as we were talking to them is there are all sorts of sources for information out there. And what came through loud and clear was that it would be great if one source was identified for support, for resources, for counseling, for anything that a small business might, might need to keep their doors open and function properly, or even navigating through these loan processes. We've determined that uh, that uh, entity should be the DeKalb Chamber of Commerce. Our Chamber President, uh, Kenny Coleman, has put together a thorough plan for how he would allocate those resources, but it's basically about building up the Chamber's capacity to be of a, a, a prime resource to our businesses in DeKalb County. And our recommendation also anticipates ongoing support for the Chamber by DeKalb County. Next slide, please. So I tried to do that within the time constraints. I hope it didn't seem rushed, but at this point, before I yield back to you, Mr. CEO, I really want to afford the members of the committee who are here any chance to offer their insights, what they've experienced, because we did this together. So uh, I, I, will, I will stop and see if there are members of our committee who want to speak. I'll, I'll recognize I'll act as presiding officer now, and I'll recognize uh, <laughs> Emory Morse. You Burger. act as yourself. You, you, you play as yourself. Because the role of presiding officer will be played by Steve Bradshaw. So Steve Bradshaw. Please go, go, Emory. Thank you. Um, first of all, it's been an honor serving on this committee. We covered a huge amount of ground, talked to a lot of great companies, a lot of people thriving, and a lot of people struggling. Uh, I want to convey the sense of urgency that we picked up. Uh, some of these folks need help with permitting. Some of them need help with financial advice. And, and, and they are looking for the county to, to move forward with urgency and strength. Second, I want to indicate that the, the money we're requesting will actually be beneficial to DeKalb County. Um, we, we talked to a number of company and property owners that are uh, losing money this year and, and may be filing for reduced property taxes in the next year. That could affect the Cab County's budget and, and the loans to these businesses will, will keep them going so that they can thrive and continue paying property taxes and sales taxes and business license fees. And then last but not least, uh, 
as Commissioner Bradshaw mentioned, uh, our, our CIDs are going strong. Uh, they adapted and, and uh, we were actually in one company yesterday that is having a record year right now, a furniture company. Uh, I've got 1,200 companies and a lot of them uh, have adapted and are moving forward. And, and we want to help them keep going and recognize and, pro and sell their success in the fact that the cab is functioning and making money right now in the middle of this war. Again, thank you. Thank you, Emory. Are there any other of our members want to speak? So I saw, I'll recognize Ann Hanlon first and then uh, Kenny Coleman. Thank you, Commissioner Bradshaw. I just, um, I'll, I'll echo everything that Emory said, you know, from a CID standpoint. Uh, I know that on behalf of the Perimeter CID, I really appreciate the opportunity to participate in the subcommittee. And I wanted to speak on two specific points. I think Commissioner Bradshaw did a very good job of getting a cross section of um, business owners included in these listening sessions. Um, I mean, we had everyone from restaurateurs, we had a meat processor, we had hotel operators. We even had on a larger scale, um, you know, big retail facilities and uh, institutional commercial owners of these properties. So I really do feel like we did a good job with the due diligence um, of getting all types of businesses uh, opinions on this. And then I just also wanted to sort of echo the recommendation number six that was in the PowerPoint, which is making the DeKalb Chamber sort of the central entity through which a lot of this is administered. Um, that was one of the recommendations that I originally supported wholeheartedly. Uh, other counties are doing that. I think you mentioned Cobb County is doing something similar. It's really, really important that all these businesses have a central go-to agency where they can actually get information and access a person on the other end of the phone call. And under Kenny's leadership, I really trust that, um, that that's the right decision to make the DeKalb Chamber the central agency to do that and support the funding for them because they are absolutely going to need to scale up in terms of their staffing and their technology. This is a, um, a large burden to place on them, but I absolutely think that Kenny and his team are up to that task. Thank you. Thanks, Ann. Go ahead, Kenny. Spotlight's on you now. Well, let me say, uh, first off, thank you to uh, Commissioner Bradshaw for his leadership. Um, really uh, did a tremendous job, I think, in guiding us through through this process, making sure we heard uh, from our businesses what we needed to hear. Um, second, I, I thank uh, uh, Emory and Ann and the rest of the committee for their support and confidence in uh, in us. I think the, uh, the chamber is uniquely positioned given the long-term history and the relationships and connectivity really across the county uh, with both the public and the private sector. Uh, last thing I'll, I'll mention is that um, one of the recommendations, just wanted to make sure uh, we really spent time and emphasized and that is allowing innovation for our businesses. W what I think we heard as much as anything is that this is a consumer confidence issue and our businesses are being creative with uh, parking lot restaurant or being able great seating restaurants and drive throughs and et cetera. And there is a real opportunity for our county to be supportive of that. So just, just want to take a moment and really emphasize that. Thank you. Thank you, Kenny. Any other members? I see the mayor Ernst. Go ahead, Mayor Ernst, please. Yes, um, echo everyone. Again, thanks for allowing me to be on this committee. Again, thank you to your, uh, Ms. Brooks for her due diligence and hurting us cats all together it was fabulous. Um, it, you know, what, I took away a lot what everyone else said, but the other big thing is we need to use this time, this op this 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 tragic time as an opportunity to set the cab up for the future and you and use the resources that we bear by the CARES Act uh, and change processes uh, and procedures and allow businesses to innovate. So in the future, as we get out of this, we have a better decap. And I think that was also very loud and clear. It's it's about now, but it's also about the future. And let's let's leverage th these monies that we have to leverage the future. Thank you, Mayor. Anybody else from our team want to weigh in? 
at present. I'm not seeing any. So at this point, I will yield the floor back to the CEO to guide us how we move forward. Uh, Dr. Ford, I think Dr. Oh, Ford. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Ford, my apologies. No problem, thank you. Um, I just wanted to recommend that, that since you said the chamber is your final um, frontier for that, that, that they partner very closely with this team that we're trying to develop. So I think that could be very helpful to you all as you move forward. I think that's a great uh, recommendation and um, oh, I totally agree. Okay, there you go. You. Mr. CEO. Thank you, Mr. Presiding Officer. And just personally, uh, thank you for uh, volunteering to lead, which is a very critical and important initiative uh, in terms of response responding to the uh, pandemic that we're facing. And I want to thank the members of your subcommittee for the outstanding work. And one of your recommendations, of course, we will be coming forward. I was waiting uh, for you all to uh, complete your work. And it's my expectation, of course, uh, uh, with your permission, uh, we'll bring forward a recommendation regarding uh, a loan program uh, for businesses in DeKalb County uh, on next Tuesday, uh, you know, with uh, your permission. And it will include, and I know, made a note while I was sitting here, a proposed appropriation to support the Chamber's effort as you recommended in your report. Thank you, sir. Uh, with that, I will yield the floor unless there are other questions. I will let the CEO take over and guide the meeting uh, where he wants to take us. Thank you, Mr. Bazaar. Now, you know, I'm, I'm, this, this is kind of disconcerting to be on this side. He always run the meetings, and I, <laughs> I speak when the, when the presiding office allows me to speak. But uh, uh, the last thing I want to really focus our attention on, the last two things, is one, uh, food insecurity. Uh, we set that out as a high priority there along with uh, health and mental health, uh, addressing food insecurity uh, in DeKalb County, Georgia. We had a presentation from the Atlanta Food Bank and, and there were several zip codes in DeKalb County where food insecurity uh, reached approximately 50% of the population. And with the support of the commissioners and, uh, and leveraging our Federal uh, CARES Act, I believe uh, that we made a tremendous impact in this area and it's ongoing and will uh, continue throughout the remainder of this year. I want to acknowledge um, Agriculture Commissioner Gary Black, uh, who's been a true uh, partner with us uh, through the Georgia Grown Program and also uh, the, uh, Kyle and the people at the Atlanta Food Bank who you hear more about their partnership with the CAB as we ensure that people, healthy people, uh, quite frankly, can't be hungry people. And so you have to feed and provide nourishment to our population, particularly when you're dealing with a deadly virus. So I'm gonna ask my chief of staff, Ms. Lakeitha Carlos, who's led this effort in my office to brief uh, the task force uh, first on our distributions. Uh, I think we've had two, uh, how many have we had, two? two distributions where we distributed over some 3,000 boxes of uh, fresh fruits and vegetables to families in need in the camp and an exciting new strategy that will begin on tomorrow uh, in partnership with uh, the Atlanta Food Bank. So Ms. Carlos, if you will brief us on these in a little bit more detail, I would appreciate it. Sure, thank you, Mr. CEO. Good morning, everyone. Um, like the CEO just said, we have um, managed two distributions so far in partnership with Georgia Grown and the Department of Agriculture. Um, and tomorrow we will add another uh, two distributions to our list. Um, we will be partnering with the Atlanta Community Food Bank. Uh, the City of Clarkston, Positive Peering Inc., and First African Community Development Corporation uh, to provide 1,200 packages of food to DeKalb residents. We will be hosting this event at two different locations. It's a part of a um, $600,000 investment that we've made with the food bank to significantly increase that organization's capacity to distribute food throughout the county. So tomorrow, those food distributions will begin at 12.30 p.m. Um, one will be in the Lithonia area. 
um, at the food pantry that is at Big Miller Grove Baptist Church. That's where First African CDC has their food pantry. Um, and the second will be in the city of Clarkston uh, with the Tahoe Village Shopping Plaza. Uh, there will be 600 boxes or packages of food. Um, residents will receive a 15 to 20 pound box of produce along with uh, dairy items, uh, milk, uh, we're not sure exactly what it'll be right now, but milk, cheese, yogurt, just a dairy package, um, and then also shelf-stable items, whether those are canned vegetables um, or proteins um, or cereal packages. So like we always do, it's going to be a drive-through um, pickup and um, the volunteers from each of those organizations will be staffing uh, those distributions, the county will be making sure that each location is secured and that traffic is uh, controlled in a way that keeps both residents and visitors safe. Um, and we will be moving these distributions around the county over the next several months uh, as we continue to fight food insecurity in all, in all corners of the county. So that's all I have. If there are any questions about tomorrow's event, I can take those. And I will add, it, and we've had, and we would love for TAS members to come out. Uh, we would have a major uh, distribution the last Saturday in this month. Uh, we've had commissioners and TAS and others, uh, local elected officials to come out and support the efforts. And uh, we encourage uh, task Force members, if you're interested, to reach out to Ms. Carlos and we'll make sure you have the direction to come and, and participate and support and engage the community at these events. It's, it's, um, it's heartbreaking at one level, but it's, it's, it's quite inspiring at another uh, because at these events, we are addressing some of the most fundamental needs that people have, uh, which is to provide food for themselves and their families. Uh, we mentioned um, tomorrow previously we partner with Telemundo, uh, La Vision, uh, uh, a newspaper who serves primarily Hispanic Latino community. We've also partnered with uh, St. Philip's AME Church, as well as it's one other organization and other organizations that will continue to build that partnership. What this is, is that the Atlanta Food Bank has 139 food pantry partners in DeKalb County. So the commissioners, and the CEO office agreed uh, to enhance what they were already doing uh, because of the, the tremendous burden that's been placed on the Atlanta area to increase uh, their uh, distribution by 30%. So it will be 30% on top of what they would normally do uh, in DeKalb County between now and the end of 2020. So this is will have and continue to have a major impact one of my basic tenets is you build capacity. You don't have to create new things. Oftentimes the most effective way and the most expeditious way to make an impact is you build capacity of existing resources. And that's what we're doing in this particular, we're just building capacity of food bank. We don't have to recreate it. We just use organizations to, that are already doing the work and allow them to actually enhance what they're already doing. So unless there are some questions, and we'd love to have you all come out uh, at the end of the month, the, the next major event uh, we'll be having, similar to others, uh, will be the last Saturday in June. Love to have you come out and be with us. Commissioner Rader. Thank you, Mr. CEO. Um, uh, further your uh, comment on building capacity, could uh, you or perhaps Mr. Williams um, brief the task force on the initiative to support community-based organizations through a direct grant program. I uh, see that just a few minutes ago, a press release did go out, so I would uh, appreciate y'all um, filling in the uh, task force on that particular effort. Well, Mr. Williams is not here, but I, I'm familiar with it. It's, uh, well, you more familiar than I am, Commissioner Rader. Why don't you okay. brief us? <laughs> All right, sure. Um, thank you, Mr. CEO. Since you were um, the initiator of it and have led that effort. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so um, the uh, obviously there are many organizations in DeKalb that work with the Atlanta Community Food Bank, not only to provide nutrition assistance, but also uh, rental uh, assistance and utility assistance, uh, sort of a 
full service wrap to folks that are struggling to maintain their uh, their stability at home. Um, the uh, effort that the Board of Commissioners funded with an initial million dollars was to um, use the same mechanism that we use on our annual grant program um, to issue a notice of funding availability and uh, receive grant proposals from such community-based organizations to uh, supplement their programs with uh, a cash infusion uh, from the county. Um, I believe that the parameters uh, are, have been established. They you know, require certain levels of um, uh, documented capacity for the group. Uh, we prioritize those that have worked with us before and it uh, under this initial tranche of funding, um, a maximum of $100,000 per organization. Um, but I would say that the, I think the uh, commission um, and I would imagine that the administration is um, going to look at the demand for this and this initial uh, notice of funding availability. I think that the uh, deadline date for it is uh, it, um, there's a June 24th deadline for it, um, applying. Um, we will be interested to know if that million dollars is oversubscribed. Um, get it on, uh, sort of get it on track uh, towards implementation and then consider uh, the resource requirements necessary for the future. So again, as we approach um, the point at which some of the pantries are starting to empty out, that um, you know, uh, the um, landlord's forbearance on past due rent starts to wear thin and the um, courts begin to entertain dispossessory requests as well as the utilities, uh, which have been uh, uh, for, uh, forestalling um, disconnections uh, through uh, July, um, all of that's gonna eventually wear off and uh, those folks will have to be paid. We hope that uh, this direct assistance can um, supplement uh, the resources that the uh, philanthropic community has provided and use that uh, capacity of existing community-based organizations to do so. So thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner, and thank you for your leadership. And obviously we'll talk about it in more detail at a future meeting uh, after uh, the list of awardees are na announced. We can talk in more detail about the collective impact that we believe these grants are going to have. Uh, but uh, thank you all so much. The one other thing, I know Mayor Ernst is on the call, and one of the things uh, I'll have um, Ms. Crowell speak to uh, with ongoing discussions about how uh, DeKalb, because it had a population of at least 500,000, received a CARES Act grant. Uh, the matter is being debated now in the General Assembly, well, in the governor's office, about how smaller jurisdictions, cities and counties, uh, how much of any of the $4 billion that the state received would be appropriated to them. Uh, had a discussion with our board of commissioners and I believe that uh, we all agree that our response to COVID, particularly when it comes to public safety and other frontline employees, we must make sure that they have the PPE necessary. On last night, Ms. Uh, Crowell sent out a communication to our municipal leaders. Uh, Ms. Crowell, you wanna brief the task force on that? Thank you, Mr. CEO. Yes, uh, last night, uh, everyone should have received the sub uh, recipient form and uh, instructions along with um, a spreadsheet outlining the process for being reimbursed for um, personal protective equipment. Um, about a week or so ago, we did receive a list from all of the cities outlining your uh, COVID related expenses. And uh, we've taken the first step to peel from that list uh, your expenses that you've outlined for um, personal protective equipment. We think this is a, a great first step in uh, securing not only your uh, employees, but the constituents that may interact with your employees uh, as each of the municipalities do their daily work. Uh, so the instructions are pretty simple, uh, straightforward. Uh, we do have a, a, a well-defined process here at the county on uh, how we would appropriate and process the request. Um, 
our, uh, our CFO, Diane McNabb, has uh, appointed Ms. Deborah Sherman, and she's the Assistant Director of Capital and Grants. She'll be the primary interface with your uh, city officials that you appoint uh, to this project. The list is, I mean, the application is pretty simple. Uh, we do ask that uh, you review it carefully, direct all of your questions. Uh, you can direct those uh, to me now, and we'll make sure those get to uh, Ms. Sherman until you make your one-on-one -on -one contacts. Um, but we do believe that we've captured everything that you'll need uh, to address your PPE uh, reimbursements. And if you have any questions, you can uh, feel free to email me or give me a call. And that's it. All right. And believe it or not, my friends, we worked our way through the entire agenda uh, on time and under budget, actually. And But we do have about 10 or 12 minutes remaining on the allotted time. And if there are comments or suggestions for me, uh, for the administration. Uh, as I've said on multiple occasions, there is no COVID-19 playbook that I've been able to discern. Uh, we are creating strategies and implementing programs as we go. And this is an extremely fluid situation. Uh, it's multi-level and very complex. And any ideas, thoughts, suggestions you have for me or the administration or for the government in particular, in general, we'd love to hear them. Uh, Commissioner Larry Johnson. Thank you, Mr. CEO. I appreciate it. Uh, just one thing I want to bring to our attention, and I know uh, Dr. Ford and Commissioner Reed are working on this, but uh, the protests have really taken away from what COVID is doing in terms of um, coordination and, and the testing and the virus is still expanding. We do need to, we have um, in our committee, we came up with a public-private partnership that's, that deals with the national testing platform. And at some point, I would love for the, the task force in the future uh, to get that information uh, to everybody so you can review because it's a free platform. The city of Austin is doing it. The city of San Jose is doing it. Um, Tarrant County, Texas is now doing it. And it's a partnership um, that was given around for MACO. But I just think uh, as we move forward, we're gonna have the flu and COVID at the same time. And so we need to have a coordinated testing uh, apparatus as opposed to um, not knowing who's testing and then trying to get the results from Walmart, CVS, Board of Health, but we don't have a, a real good system. So the, the virus and the results we have may be only coming from the Board of Health, but it may not be coming from all of these other entities that are doing testing as well. So we may not be getting the true picture as I would like for us to get based on zip code. So that's one thing. The other thing uh, is about this um, proposal that has come forward from the uh, Small Business Task Force. Uh, I know it's probably gonna come before us as the board, so I'll talk more about it next week because you have some more proposals. But if a business is, is gonna ask for a reduction in taxes and all those things, uh, we may have to look at in terms of the grant, if, if that's going to be part, if they still can get the grant, the full amount, and still get reductions and permits and other things, because that that impacts us as well. So I just want that to be part of the total discussion uh, as we move forward. Uh, and I have uh, one more issue, but we'll talk about it next week on who should be coordinating um, the businesses in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Dr. Ford. Uh, good morning, Commissioner Johnson. I just want to respond to your first um, statement in terms of testing. Um, irrespective of who provides the test in the Cab County, uh, COVID is a reportable disease, so we get everyone's data. So that that is the good thing about it, um, is that no matter who does the testing, all the data has to go to the state. Yeah, but the state hadn't been doing, I'll talk offline. With some. And if you could send me a copy, if you could send me a copy of the report, that would be helpful. I see what you just posted on, on, uh, on the page. Thank you so much. 
once again, I want to thank you all for spending your at least the last hour and 15 minutes with us. Uh, and I'm very proud of not only the people who presented today, but I'm proud of the camp. I really am. And uh, this is unprecedented what we're facing. I, I was sharing uh, with some friends of all the years I spent in public services. And it's hard to really explain to the general public how difficult it is to generate any progress of any nature in this environment. It, it, it's it's the, the anxiety levels are high, uh, the fear, the trepidation, and for just on these three reports we heard today and on the other initiative that we're all involved in, it's really quite an accomplishment to create an, uh, programs or strategies where you can actually net a positive outcome for the people we serve. If you really look around, and I'm not criticizing, most public sector agencies basically are not fully engaged right now because it's not a criticism of them, but it's just so difficult to get anything done. It is just so difficult to get anything done. And then you add on top of that, the, the anger and rage, righteous as it might be, uh, around police brutality and the use of force, all of these things are coming to bear simultaneously at one point at one time on men and women uh, on this call. And the fact that we are able to communicate, to work together, come up with ideas and then actually implement them is outstanding. So I thank you all so much. I encourage you and pray that you'll be safe. And of course, we'll look forward to speaking in the near future. Thank you.